from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our 15th National Book Festival. We started the Book Festival back in 2001. That's probably before most of you here were born. But uh, we've been doing this a long time, and we'll continue to do it a long time. My name is Guy Molinara, and I'm the co-director of the National Book Festival. So thank you so much for joining us. And it's my pleasure to introduce our next author. Jennifer Holm is a New York Times best-selling author inspired by her own childhood. She has written the Newbery Honor receiving novels Turtle in Paradise, Penny from Heaven, and Our Only May Amelia, as well as the Boston Jane series. Instead of fighting with him for the comic section of the newspaper, Jennifer Holm now collaborates with her brother Matthew Holm to produce the award-winning Baby Mouse and Squish graphic novel series. Her newest work is Sunny Side Up. And I also want to remind you that Jennifer will be signing her books, which are for sale in our book sales shop from 7 to 8, right after this presentation. So please welcome Jennifer Holm. I feel like the principal. Do I look like the principal? No. Principals don't wear green dresses. Well, I am so happy to see you guys here today. I'm so happy to see so many kids in the audience. Have we got moms, dads, teachers, librarians, pet rocks? <gasps> well, luckily, I brought a pet rock. I really did. Does anybody remember Pet Rocks? Yes. Well, I'm going to talk about this in a little bit. So, unfortunately, my brother Matt couldn't be here today, so I'm going to have to do all the talking for both of us. And I thought I'd start off with talking a little bit about our childhood. In order to do that, we have to go a long time ago in a galaxy. What? In a suburb far, far away. Bonk! That is how our collaboration started. The brilliant collaboration of my brother, Matt, sitting on top of me in the kiddie pool in the backyard. Typical. Yeah, I don't let him sit on top of me anymore, you guys. I am the older sister. We had a pretty typical childhood. You know, I was a ballet dancer, and Matt played baseball. Any baseball fans? Yes. And we hung out in trash cans. Who hung out? Who hangs out in trash cans here? Who recognizes that trash can? Anybody? Who is it? Oscar. And when we were growing up, this is a, a picture of us growing up. We always, my for some reason, our dad, on Christmas, on any occasion when we had to like come down for something exciting, he would make us like wait at the top of the stairs, slowly coming down, like release the hounds, but we'd have to get a picture first. And this is like one of those classic pictures. And when we were growing up, Matt loved books. I mean, he really loved books. He loved them so much. We have about a million pictures of my brother Matt sleeping with books. <laughs> I had a hard time actually picking which ones to use. And while he loved books, I loved comics. And I actually found historical proof of my love of comics. There I am sitting with my, my own stash of comics on Christmas morning. See, when I was growing up, I grew up in a big family, and I am the middle child, and I'm the only girl. So what does that mean? How many brothers did I have? Oh, wait, I had five. There were five of us. How many brothers? Four. What do you think about that? Do you think it was smelly in our house? <laughs> My mom was a big fan of those Glade Air Freshener sticks. Um, and when we were growing up, I would read what my brothers were reading. And my brothers were big comic readers. And so I read everything that they were reading, like, shout it out. Who's that guy? And what about that guy? Hmm, who is that? The Incredible Hulk. And who's that? 
Swamp Thing rules. He was actually my favorite superhero when I was growing up. Can anybody guess why? Anybody have a good guess why I liked a creature that looked like a piece of moss or an asparagus? Yes. Oh my goodness. You, sh you could just come up here. You are like channeling me. <laughs> yes, because sw Swamp Thing was great. Like what you see is what you get. I mean, he's just a piece of swamp. He doesn't need a cape. He's charming enough without it. Oh, yes. Do I, do I like Swamp Thing? I am a fan of asparagus, I do. I <laughs> there are thumbs up in the front row. Team asparagus? Team Swamp Thing? Oh my goodness, this is the strangest presentation I've ever done. Um, and when I was growing up in the old days, the 70s, parents, that's historical fiction now. There weren't a lot of ladies in comics, but there was one. Does anybody know who was a big, popular comic book heroine? Who do you think? Wonder Woman. So I'm not sure why I didn't identify with her. Hmm. I guess it's because that's a picture of me when I was about oh, eight years old. And Wonder Woman, hmm. I mean, look at me now. I guess it had to do with that whole thing that she runs around in her underwear. What is that about? And I was always wishing that there was a comic book with a girl who kind of was like me. Maybe a little bit like Sunny in Sunny Side Up. Yay. And actually, if you look at some very old pictures of me, I kind of resemble the character. Um, and so I took a lot of elements of my brother Matt and our, of my childhood, and we combined them to make Sunny Side Up. That's a little spread from it. And so how do you go about making something that's a little autobiographical? Has anybody here ever wanted to draw their own comic? Nice. Or even write their own story? Sweet. So. That is awesome to hear. So I'm going to sort of take you through a few tricks of the trade that Matt and I used for making Sunny Side Up. And it, you don't actually need all that much. It's, it's actually pretty simple. I bet every kid in the audience could probably do a comic that's inspired by their own lives. So this is how we started. We needed a time period. And sometimes just regular things can help you identify a time period. Like in the old days when I was growing up, we used typewriters. Now, do you guys use typewriters? No. What do you use now? A computer, right? And so we had to figure out what time period we were going to be in. So our time period, actually our year is 1976. And the book takes place during the 70s, which was a pretty bad time in fashion, you guys. So you all dodged a bullet, all the kids up front. And see, back in the 70s, I just thought I'd take you on a, a memory lane trip. This is what kids dress like. But that's okay. The kids weren't the worst, you guys. That's what dads dress like. <laughs> that is my dad. <laughs> and not even that. That's what kitchens looked like. <laughs> Does anybody remember kitchens that look like that? Yes, yes. And another thing that happened in 1976, it was this big moment. It was called the Bicentennial. And it was America's 200th birthday. And it was like this country went bonkers for a year about red, white, and blue. Everything was red, white, and blue. Kids were hauling flags around. The Liberty Bell was super popular in Philadelphia. Even poor little birthday cakes didn't get a break during 1976. Every kid in my family had like a bicentennial birthday cake. Kind of a bummer. And so in Sunny Side Up, we have this little, little moment in the book with all these moments that we remember from the bicentennial. And of course, the best was Jell-O mold. Who likes Jell-O? Jell-O is eternal. Jell-O can last many generations. So first you need to set it in a time period. 
And then you need the actual setting. So where is it going to take place if you're going to write a story inspired by your life? So is most everybody here kind of from the greater DC, Virginia, Maryland area? Mostly, so you could kind of set it around here. And so we needed to figure out where we wanted to set it. And I actually grew up in, in Pennsylvania outside of Philadelphia, which is why the bicentennial was such a big deal. But we wanted to kind of place the book in two places. And when you're doing graphic novels, you need to show in a quick panel where you are. So we had an obvious way to do that with Welcome to Florida, when Sonny's arriving in the airport. But then we had some other things, like one thing I always remember, so my grandfather lived in Florida and we used to visit him. And when you would drive down near where he lived in Florida, there were orange groves everywhere. So that was a little nod to where he lived in Florida. But probably the craziest thing about my grandfather was he lived in an over 55 retirement community. And you know what that means? No kids allowed. Or dogs or cats. Literally, it's all, what do you think? Is it all babies? No, what is it? It's all old people everywhere. Oh my goodness. In fact, the first time we went there, my, my brothers and I, I think our heads exploded because we kept asking, can kids live here? And my grandfather said, definitely not. And no pets either. So <laughs> we weren't quite sure if we were on the same level as the pets. And we had to get a visitor pass to be able to just walk around and use the pool or be anywhere because they didn't want kids roaming around the area. So there's all these shots of what it's like to live in Florida. And then of course, you can go from this big broad setting, like a place, to an intimate setting. Like my grandfather's condo or Gramps' condo in the book, which is a interesting shade of kind of peachy pink. Did anybody have grandparents who have strange looking houses on the inside? Strange colors, wood paneling, no, orange carpet, that's good. The next thing you need is your voice. Like what is your voice? So your voice is really the personality uh, that's gonna sort of shine through your characters. So in Sunny Side Up, ways to show like what your voice is, is what, what are you excited about? What are your passions? Do you like a favorite book series? Do you like, hmm, like a, a band? Like I'm trying to think, who's big now? Justin Bieber? No. Who's good? One Direction? No. Who do we like these days? Who do you like? Andy Grammer. Andy Grammer? All right, right on Andy Grammer. Um, so in the book, Buzz, a friend that Sonny meets in Florida, he loves comics. He's obsessed with comics. And something else that can help define your personality is what kind of dreams do you have? What do you wish more for more than anything? And when Sonny is in the book and when I was a kid, you know what I dreamed of? I dreamed of going to the Jersey Shore. Does anybody go to the Jersey Shore here? Or you go to more like that Delaware Shore, Ocean City, Maryland in the house, nice. Well, she dreams of going to the shore and getting fudge and going boogie boarding. And of course, some things that define your personality are your hairstyle. And there was this famous Olympian called, what was her name? Does anybody remember? Oh, and what was her haircut called? Does anybody remember? Now, her haircut was quite amazing because she had thick, thick hair. And so every kid, every girl in America was getting their hair cut like Dorothy Hamill, including me. Pretty sad, right? Yeah, the wedge did not work on people with straight hair. <laughs> and another little thing is just like hobbies and little, and little details. Like anybody remember record players? Record players? I heard record players are making a comeback with kids. Yes? I heard records are making a comeback. I'm, so, I'm happy to see that. And just other things. When I was a kid, the most important thing in, in, the, in your room, actually wasn't even in your room, it was your door. It defined your personality. I spent hours decorating my door. In fact, one thing I always, you know, stickers and little pictures, and I had tons of stuff on my door. And then there are all the characters in your book. 
You know, and I bet you know some of the characters already. You can kind of draw from real life a little bit. Like, Sonny has a grandpa named Gramps, and I have a grandpa named Gramps. Although he's 100 years old now. He turned 100 in April. And he had these, um, there were a lot more ladies in the old, in the neighborhood, in the over 55 community, like many, many more ladies. And even though these, these ladies were like in their 80s and 90s, it didn't matter. He would always call them the girls. The girls are coming over, and every time he said that, I would get so excited, like there would be another kid that I could play with. But no, it was the girls were coming over. <laughs> um, and then there's also Buzz. Buzz was inspired by my best friend um, as an adult from New York who was a big lover of comics and somebody who, to this day, we bond over comics. And of course, characters don't have to be people. They can be alligators, like Big Al. So my grandfather lived in this retirement community, and on, like, all around it was this big golf course, and they had lots of ponds where golf balls would go into. And they had a resident alligator that they called very creatively Big Al. And the alligator would just come out and sleep on the golf course all the time. And, and nobody seemed to be worried about it. And it just kind of, as kids, we didn't understand why weren't they putting this alligator in, in the zoo or something. And then we need something to help make the story go forward. We need like a conflict. We need something to like make the action happen. And in the book, one of the conflicts is that Sonny's grandpa smokes cigarettes and he's getting sick from them and he's supposed to be quitting. But she, and he's told Sonny that he's quit smoking cigarettes, but she keeps finding cigarettes all over the house, like in cereal boxes and all, all strange places. And I kind of got that idea. It seems to me like a lot of old people I've known, as they got older, they started hiding things in weird places. Like um, I had an aunt um, who would just like pin money behind curtains. <laughs> like you might just close the curtains and there'd be like $100 bills. I just didn't understand why pe old people did that. So um, I was kind of inspired by that. And then the best part of writing is all the details. Cause that, that gives you all the flavor in the book. And in the 70s, there were a lot of awesome details. They used to make metal lunch boxes. Can you imagine they made, they gave children metal lunch boxes that if you just went like this, it would bash in another kid's head. And why do I know that happened? Because Matt got his head bashed in by a lunchbox just because some kid was standing at the bus stop and he was like, hey. And Matt was right there. So, yeah, so they used to make metal lunchboxes. And it was like a big part of the year, like picking out your, your backpack, picking out your lunchbox was huge. And so in the books, and Sunny, um, she gets to pick out her lunchbox. And the lunchboxes were cool in the old days. They had these awesome little therm matching thermoses in them. I love that. And of course, they had all these little things like pet rocks. So I need a volunteer to come up and check out my pet rock. Where's, I need a kid. <gasps> Why don't you on the end with the pink? Why don't you come up here? This is an authentic 70s pet rock from eBay. Um, I had a pet rock, and I actually didn't bring my actual pet rock, but um, this, was the, this was the actual born pet rock. Um, you want to check it out? Is he sleeping? <laughs> Thank you so much. Yes, yeah, so someday, and it came with a book called The Care and Training of Your Pet Rock. Um, so, it was, so we were very, when the, the pet rock thing craze happened up when, when, I, when in my neighborhood, we were like, this is pretty clever. They're selling rocks. So w as kids, we actually were like, we're going to ride this pet rock thing. So we used to gather rocks and paint them and sell them in front of our house. And people bought them. The adults, adults are crazy. They will buy anything from a kid. I sold a lot of pet rocks. And there were also like great posters. There was this, this iconic poster, hang in there, it was a cat. I had like three of these. 
And there's our pet rock. Oh, see? Those are all the painted rocks. And then the other fun little detail was like a big thing that kind of a big craze that hit in the 70s were um, cafeteria restaurants. It was like you would actually pay. Can you imagine like paying to go to a restaurant that was kind of like a school lunch line? I know. Like I said, adults will buy anything. It's crazy. And there would be all this food. And so in Sunny Side Up, the same thing happens to her. And the most crazy thing, of course, about the 70s was Kids, you don't want to go back in time because adults, in addition to buying anything, had no sense. Because kids could sit in the front seat without a seat belt. There were no car seats. It's crazy. And there was also this, this cool new thing called a hide-a-bed, which I, I was so excited to, to meet one. Where if you, It's a couch that looks like it's actually a bed in the couch. Does anybody have one of these now? I hear they still make them. But you pull it out, and it's the most uncomfortable thing you'll ever sleep on in your entire life, even as, like, a 10-year-old child, because they squeak. Now sit down and... Woohoo! Well, you know what? We have a little time left, so I thought if anybody has questions, they set up these two cool mics on either side of the room. If kids want to come up and ask me, like, how my pet rock is doing, did he sleep on the plane, or about writing... Okay, let's go this way and this way. We'll start over here. How long does it take you to write one comic book? <sighs> you know what, sunny side up, uh, usually with a baby mouse or a squish, that usually takes me about four months, five months, but with sunny side up, that took me m more like two years because I worked on it off and on. But good question. Yes. Um, who inspired you to write Sunny's older brother? You know, we had a family member who had, he had some, some problems. Does anybody here in the room know somebody who's having a hard time in their life and it, it kind of makes you a little sad sometimes or you don't know how to talk about it? Anybody know anybody like that? Well, you might know somebody in life eventually. And there was definitely somebody when we were growing up who made me feel a lot of sad feelings because I felt like I couldn't talk about it. And I think for kids now, is it good to keep all those bad, sad feelings in your bucket? What do we need to do? We need to empty that bucket and get those bad feelings out and maybe talk to somebody. Okay. Um, why did you start the Baby Mouse series? Like, what inspired you? What inspired Baby Mouse? So Baby Mouse, when Matt and I were growing up, we actually, my, our dad had made me a big dollhouse. Like, it was like a three-story dollhouse. And instead of having dolls, we had these little gray-dressed mice, which was this other crazy thing from the 70s. They used to sell little mice in like Hallmark stores with outfits on them, and I have like 50 of them. So, good question. What did your pet rock eat? You know, his name is Francis. He's gotten a little difficult. He um, started off very simply with some Cheerios, but since he came to DC, he's been nagging me to take him for sushi, and I just really don't feel like it's worth it to take him for sushi, so, yes. Are you planning to write any new books? Yes, yes, so I actually just finished a prequel to Turtle in Paradise. Has anybody read Turtle in Paradise? Yep, so I just turned it in, so maybe might come out next year. We'll see what happens. Okay, who's over here? What, uh, how old is your pet rock? Well, this pet rock, this is an old pet rock. This pet rock is like a 1974 pet rock. So it's about 40 years old in rock years. <laughs> in real life, he's like seven. <laughs> Can I have him? <laughs> Do you know how many people I had to bid against for this pet rock? <laughs> a lot of people. No, no. Once a pet rock, always a He's part of the family now. Yeah. Who is your favorite author? <gasps> Who's my favorite author? Oh my goodness, there are so many amazing authors in the world. So my favorite author when I was a kid, it was an author named Lloyd Alexander, but probably my favorite author now, who's alive, is an author named Kirby Larson. Has anybody read anything by Kirby Larson? Hattie Big Sky, 
She writes amazing, amazing books. Yes. Hi, my name is Alex, and my question is, how do you get your ideas? How do I get my ideas? Well, I'm going to tell you a secret. When you're a kid, just keep notes anytime anything happens. Like when your brother spills chocolate milk all over your head. Yeah, write that down. And then in about 30 years, you can get back at him for that. Um, are you happy with all the books that you've made? Like, are you surprised that you've made like this many books? I am. It's crazy. I'm, we, we only make books because you guys read them. If you didn't read them, they wouldn't exist, so thank you guys. Writers can't exist unless there are readers. So you're like part of our story. Um, what inspired Penny in Squish? Wow, this is like, this crowd is tough. So Penny was inspired by my mom, who actually grew up in New Jersey in the 1950s, and her name is? Penny. It is. And Squish, that's an easy one. So Squish was inspired by my brother, Matt. Um, and if you ever meet him, you'll understand why. Because Matt looks like an amoeba. It's true. So if you ever meet him, you'll, you'll, you'll say hi. You do kind of look like an amoeba with the baseball cap on. Yes. Um, when did you start writing? So I started, well, obviously I wrote in school, right? Are you guys writing now? Yep. I was not, to be honest, a good diary keeper when I was a kid. I actually started writing my first book when I was uh, 23, and that was called Our Only May Amelia. And that was like two years ago. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> what inspired you to write comics? Why comics? Why comics? Because I grew up reading comics. Not only did my brothers read comics, but our dad was probably the biggest comic fan in the house. Um, our dad loved Prince Valiant and Flash Gordon, so, and, and so when I was growing up, we actually had these bound volumes of uh, Prince Valiant in the house. So, good question. Yes. Hi, my name's Caroline, and my question is, what was your favorite book growing up? My favorite book growing up was probably The Black Cauldron by Lloyd Alexander. Never heard of it. <laughs> Wait, what did she say? <laughs> okay, it's still in libraries. Look, that puppy. Up. They're releasing a new edition this year, you guys. I just saw it. They're re-releasing it in paperback with a cool cover, so definitely check it out. What is the first book you've ever wrote? My, the first book I ever wrote was called Our Only May Amelia. It was like 100 years ago. And so there was this guy named Mark Twain, and he and I were like fighting to get published at the same time. All right, I think we have time for one last question from a friend. In Baby Mouse, who's your favorite character? Oh, all right. Thank you for asking. So I do love Baby Mouse, obviously. But my secret favorite character is Georgie the Giraffe because his head is always cut off at the top of the page. And that started out by accident because I drew him in in a panel. And Matt's like, yeah, obviously his head should really hardly ever show in the book <laughs> because he's too tall. Well, everybody, thank you so much for coming to the National Book Festival. So exciting to meet you guys. And I'm going to be signing at um, 7 o'clock, so I hope to see you then. Have a good tonight. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.